Yes, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Hazel, for doing the legwork, and also shout out to uh, co-Arctic data team lead, uh, Jonathan Blythe, for, for assisting with coordinating this. So while the focus of this project that we're going to uh, hear about today is really nautical charting around the world, I thought it would be good to uh, coordinate a presentation to the Arctic collaborations to see how uh, that product, the, those AIS maps we're about to see, may be used to support scientific research in the Arctic, just to kind of explore this idea. Uh, so I'm very happy that we got this group together to uh, explore those issues. So again, we'll hear this presentation, but be thinking about potential science applications. We, we do leave good time for discussion at the end. Um, so with that, our, presentation, our presenters from NGA Map Large, uh, they have terrific expertise in maritime issues and big data mapping, uh, so I anticipate a terrific discussion to follow their presentation. So everyone, please join me in welcoming our presenters, Ted Schindler and Alex Chernoff um, from NGA and Map Large. So over to you, Ted and Alex. Uh, thanks, Mike. Appreciate the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone, um, or good morning uh, in Alaska. Uh, yeah, my name is Ted Schindler. Uh, I'm a maritime analyst in the Maritime Safety Office. Uh, and I'm one of two strategic uh, engagement representatives for this project. Uh, my colleague, uh, Kayla Hendricks, uh, she's in research. Uh, she could not uh, be here today, unfortunately. So I'll do my best to fill those shoes. Um, I'm gonna mostly represent the uh, Maritime Safety Office's perspective on this. So, um, so I'll talk about a little bit about strategic goals, partnership collaboration and things like that. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Alex who's going to get into the meat of, uh, of the work that's actually being done and, um, and, and show a demo of, of what some of these results look like. Um, so thank you again, everyone. I appreciate the time. Um, my goal here today is to, is to introduce this public-private partnership that NGA is funding and leading, um, which is going to use AIS data to map global traffic, uh, maritime traffic density uh, for the entire globe. We can go to the next uh, slide. So this is going to be a web-based uh, service. It's going to use terrestrial and satellite AIS data. Um, and what you see here is kind of a, a good example. If you were to zoom in uh, on this raster uh, down, you would get down to the one kilometer scale. Uh, you would get the amount of vessel hours uh, in that cell for the month of October 2020. Um, and the goal is Again, we're going to show historical data going back over 10 years, um, and it's going to be updated uh, month to month. Um, you can go to the next slide. So in the spirit of the UN's uh, Decade on Ocean Science um, and, and as part of NGA strategic goals, we're trying to really collaborate with industry stakeholders and, and, and strategic partners to get input and feedback on, on this service and this product during the development uh, stage, uh, rather than after design decisions have already been made. So that again, to really hammer in on why I'm here today um, is to uh, get everyone's perspective here and um, hopefully get some ideas going and, and some engagement that we can then use to make this, this uh, service as useful and accurate as possible to suit the, the various needs of, of the community. Um, we can go to the, uh, to the next slide here. So again, here's a good shot of, um, of Panama Canal traffic in uh, October 2020. Um, Again, this is a little bit outdated. We've added more filters in. Um, we're working on draft filters as well in different buckets. But the idea is we're going to be able to filter down um, and really sort of you know, see individual vessel types, uh, specifications, um, and things like that to, to, to be as useful as possible. Um, right now, we're basing our methods on um, the European Marine Observation and Data Network, EMODnet. Um, an initial dissemination is gonna focus on using uh, the Intel GIS uh, manager uh, server via IHO, but we are envisioning larger scale dissemination. Of, you know, the ultimate goal here is to make something that is going to be um, accessible, readily accessible by you know, the general public. So we want to put a uh, 
very powerful data analysis tool into the hands of basically anybody who wants to use it. Um, so part of that process, again, is getting input from as many stakeholders as possible. Uh, next slide. Looks like that slide got something got corrupted there. Yeah. So, um, yeah. do you want me to switch over to the PowerPoint? I can do that quickly. No, it's fine. We, we could probably. We're going to see the demo here shortly, so some of these screenshots are more set up for when that's not the case. So we can, we can probably uh, skip the next slide, or skip this slide as, as well. Yeah. So here's some of the the various stakeholders and partners that we've been engaging with. Um, just to give you an idea, we're, we currently uh, have been receiving a lot of feedback from various beta testers, um, and those those beta testers represent a wide swath of, of the maritime community, um, various government agencies, foreign government partners uh, from regional hydrographic commissions, as well as um, academia, both domestic and foreign. Um, we have Currently, the, the format we get feedback in is, is in the form of a survey uh, where users submit their notes. But we've also done some some one on one interviews and gotten some really rich feedback there that has um, helped develop this uh, this service uh, even more. Let me go to the next slide. So this is an updated, just kind of a little sh uh, short update that uh, was recently put in um, to update. Uh, the assistant director of the IHO uh, recently. Um, so it kind of goes over what I've just said, but um, the big takeaway here is that we're still accepting feedback. Uh, we're still engaging uh, community users as yourselves and looking um, to really stimulate discussion on, on this service as we are developing it um, to then make uh, to then make this available by the end of 2021. And I think the next one is the last slide. Yeah, so again, before I turn it over to Alex, I just wanna uh, really foot stomp that. I uh, invite everyone here today when they're seeing the demo shortly um, to really think about the various use cases uh, that, that this service uh, could provide um, in your own research and your colleagues' research, um, as is the case with a lot of um, geospatial intelligence that NGA uh, creates and provides, there is often uses beyond what we initially envisioned. So we're looking at this, you know, in the Maritime Safety Office from a hydrographic perspective, a safety of navigation perspective. Where can we, where can we um, fix our gaps, right, in, in, in nautical product coverage? But as is the case uh, with a lot of the stuff we create, there are people out there, there are partners out there who come up with ways to use our products and our services that go far beyond what we ever envisioned. And we want to foster and encourage that and, and invite it. So with that said, thanks again. Um, I'll turn it over to Alex, who's gonna show a demo of, of, of the service as it currently stands. Yeah, thanks, Ted. And uh, again, just appreciate this group for uh, having us here and um, the ability to share some of the great work our teams have been doing to put out this product. Um, you know, I, I know anytime we can get some analytics uh, in, into a format like this that allows us to broadly share and engage with uh, communities of interest like you all, it's really exciting. And so um, over the last nine months, we've been, you know, kind of getting everything ready behind the scenes, getting ready for our beta test, which started about three months ago and is uh, just sort of recently, I'll say, kind of wrapped up. And, uh, and now we have the opportunity to uh, take the feedback from that beta test. We're starting to integrate that all together. And very shortly, we're hoping to have this service out to the community uh, in, in public's hands. And, and that is um, extremely exciting. Um, let me move this panel over here. So um, what you're viewing is what we sent to uh, the users of our beta test, which is uh, uh, an external site that we have all of the uh, GMTDS raster data on uh, at this particular time. Uh, we, we did the test for um, the year 2020. So we took uh, our AIS source data from 2020 and we aggregate it by month. And then we, um, we also uh, sort of divide it into uh, roughly one kilometer square grid cells 
across the entire globe. So you can see, uh, and by the name of the program, this is a global maritime traffic density service. So we have uh, globally available AIS data. And one of the really exciting things that we have going on for us right now is that um, we, we've actually found some ways to acquire and obtain multiple sources of AIS data. And we're integrating all of those together to increase the fidelity and competence in these numbers. And um, so that's something that we're kind of working on at this particular moment as we get ready for the production release of GMTDS. Um, so uh, as we said, this is a service um, and it's a service in a couple of different ways. It's a service uh, in, in this particular way, which is we are offering a, a UI, a visualization and a little dashboard for users to be able to in, integrate, touch um, and explore and investigate the data. Um, but it's also service in, in the most pure sense, in the sense that um, we actually service enable this data via a WMS feed so that um, other clients are able to pick up this, um, this work and leverage it inside of their own frameworks. Um, so we've been working with, as Ted mentioned, the Intu GIS team over at the IHO. Um, we've been working with some folks at NOAA. We've been working with C-Vision. I think there's a lot of appetite to take this these layers that we'll be producing and publish them into a variety of different formats. Um, so let me show you a few of the features of, of the demo. Um, I think that this will be uh, um, really useful. Um, so at the top right here, it's a, it's a pretty simple UI. We have our timeline filter here for the year um, where you can play the data over time. You can step through it. So as I kind of step through, you'll see some of this uh, kind of change uh, as we do this. Um, as I hover over the map, you'll notice that we actually get the calculated value of each of the grid cells and how many hours per square kilometer are spent here uh, in, in one of these particular grid cells with our uh, friendly legend here at the top. Um, we also anticipate adding some contextual layers like ports and poten potentially bathymetry. So we've added the ability for your users to kind of use the opacity here to um, either fade or, or um, make those layers darker or less transparent. Um, and then as Ted talked about, we have um, column filters. Um, so the two that we had selected for the beta test were navigation status and ship type. Uh, so let's look at ship type for a second. So when I select the ship type column, um, it now gives me a list down here of all the available ship types that we have. Um, and, and based on some of the beta test feedback, these, this list is gonna change slightly. Um, so again, we sort of use this as an opportunity to take a look at some of this data determine whether it felt right, um, talk about whether um, different maritime community groups needed, you know, some groups or other groups. Um, and so uh, here, if, if I have cargo selected, you can see all of the cargo ships. Uh, if I select tankers, you'll see a different kind of set of results that have returned back as well. Uh, and and uh, sort of on and on. So if you wanna just see like sailing vessels, for instance, you'll see those mainly hug the coastlines, they aren't transiting. Uh, but mostly mostly sit around the coast. Um, so, so that was one filter type that we had uh, implemented. Uh, the other is, is another what I'll call, um, you know, useful filter for us to beta test because it actually gave us uh, some more insight in the fact that um, some of the AIS data that we get isn't necessarily accurate, especially when we want to do um, density calculations. So one of the things that we noticed is um, if you have something that's like moored or anchored, and I zoom out, you can see obviously that these statuses aren't particularly correct. Uh, these ships are definitely not moored or anchored that are transiting through this passageway. And you can see as I zoom out, you know, the problem is, is a fairly global one um, at that. And so um, one of the things that we spent some time doing over the last three months is enhancing the technology pipeline about how we process the AIS data into density rasters to enable us to look at um, either more specific or truth level data uh, so that we don't have to rely as much on the manually inputted AIS data that can sometimes be a little bit messy and um, not particularly accurate. Um, so for, uh, for production, what we're looking at, as Ted kind of highlighted, is looking at um, filter types for drafts and also some filter types based on the speed. And we're still a little bit uncertain about how we're gonna do that, so stay tuned. But um, we have sort of two options there, one of them being we can uh, use the speed that's reported by AIS, which is typically by GPS, which should be fairly accurate. Um, but our platform also has the ability to calculate speed um, since we are kind of um, gathering every dot. And we, we collect, um, I think right now we have over 20 billion AIS um, observations 
Uh, we anticipate that to increase as we're collecting data month by month here into uh, 2021 and 2022 here in the next six months. Um, and so um, as we accumulate all this data, we can have the ability now to process through all of this content and create some really interesting filters to specifically highlight activity or movement in the data and calculate those densities that would be uh, most valuable for you all out there in the maritime community. Um, so let me show you a quick um, demo of, of one area that I think is, um, is fairly interesting here. So I'm gonna go over to Paris here um, in the La Havre region of Paris. Um, and I'm gonna set my time bounds here uh, to, uh, let's just call it August to December, uh, kind of towards the end of the month. Um, I'm gonna select August and I'm just gonna play this through and hopefully this comes through on the screen share really well. Um, but what you'll end up seeing here is um, in October, you see a really big um, kind of bright pink spot occur in the middle uh, of that particular waterway. Um, and so doing some homework, I, I actually did some Googling and tried to figure out what's going on there. That, that month, uh, starting October 1st, is when the French are able to scallop fish off that particular coast. So you can actually start to see some of these fishing patterns emerge. Um, over time. Um, and as we sort of get deeper into the program, there are other things that I think we'll be able to do to um, start to do some of this analysis, uh, potentially start to highlight some of these changes a little bit more instead of maybe randomly stumbling over them like I kind of did. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to move over here. Um, so this is um, not, was not part of the beta test. Um, but this is work that we started um, uh, about three months ago uh, to integrate polar projections um, into, our, um, into our product as well. Um, so let me zoom out a couple more clicks here. Um, so this is our polar um, uh, projections. So this is EPSG, I always forget the number, 3099. Uh, 3995 for the Arctic, and then we also have EPSG 3031 for the Antarctic, and we're looking at um, the, um, the transverse Mercator, I think, projection that also has some polar um, options as well. Uh, but these will be part of the production release. And again, you can kind of see the dashboard works very similarly here, where we have a timeline, we can step through time. Uh, but instead of getting these ugly Mercator uh, views up towards the poles where you all really care about, uh, we get much nicer, more beautiful, natively rendered polar projection uh, data. And what's really important about that um, is it's actually two, two really uh, critical things that we were able to accomplish here. So the, the first is um, that we actually uh, perform the density calculations in the native Arctic um, polar projection. And so um, instead of trying to render it in uh, Mercator or WGS84 and then sort of stretch those bounds up towards the pole and fit a density into something that doesn't quite match up, um, we're actually getting a much more accurate analytic reading uh, when we do the uh, analytic pipeline calculation this particular way. Uh, and then the second is performance. Um, so if we were to do this and sort of have to reproject all of our um, WGS84 and what more paper uh, projections into polar, um, not only would they be slightly less accurate, but it would also take a much longer time to do. And, and from a user experience standpoint, that's something that we want to make sure um, we get uh, we get out to you guys is, is, a, is a performant product. Uh, but again, this works sort of very similarly. As I click through time, you'll see the, the density rasters change here from a polar projection perspective. You can start to see what I would assume are, uh, are survey vessels uh, zigzagging back and forth through the Arctic waters um, towards the summer months. And then uh, as you start to get, get a little bit more towards the winter, you'll see the southern creep uh, come in uh, as the ships, uh, more, more ships uh, kind of avoid some of the ice. Okay, um, let's see, let me demo two more things and then I'm gonna turn it over to questions. There might be some in the comments here. I'm, I'm not doing a great job of paying attention to that, but if you just bear with me for, for one more second while I show um, this. So this is the um, Into GIS uh, IHO Web Manager in its kind of beta mode. Um, so I had mentioned that we are able to leverage and utilize these um, density rasters as a WMS layer. And so um, the Into GIS is a, is a totally separate web viewer um, that allows you to kind of see a variety of different uh, contextual maritime layers. And they've integrated here our 
global traffic density service here. And you can see that they've built their own little user experience uh, based on this so that you can um, kind of kind of get a good sense of what's going on here for um, for the traffic densities. And so as I um, sort of flip through time here, you'll see that that also works now. You'll see our little density um, legend over here on the right hand side is displayed nicely for them. And then um, as you uh, turn on and off these uh, different um, filters here, you'll get uh, the different rasters uh, showing up based on your selection. So you can take these layers and integrate them into just about any web experience uh, that you uh, so desire. And so um, that is our, is our hope. Um, okay, let's see. I think, I think that's where I'm going to pause. So Mike, I've left a half hour. I hope that's enough time. If we want to talk about some more things, um, I have a few other um, like uh, hidden treats if we want to talk about some of those things. But um, I think I'll, I'll toss it back over and I'll take a look now potentially at um, the chat window and see if I've missed any questions. Thanks so much, Ted and Alex. That was terrific. So, um, you know, this is a, a, a data data focus. So your your questions, you know, it's fair game to talk at the technical level, but we also want to scale back and think about broad picture applications, particularly in the science domain. And uh, Hazel, um, I'm hoping that you're taking a look at the the questions. But before we get to uh, group questions, I just want to first uh, an acronym that's been thrown around is IHO. That's the International Hydrographic Organization, and that's one of the primary partners that we've kind of engaged in this in this project. And that's you know that's uh, the U.S. interacting with 20, 90 plus member states uh, that that get together and coordinate um, uh, charting and, and uh, relevant maritime safety uh, information standards and policy. And that's, I think they just uh, a few days ago celebrated their 100th anniversary. So it's been, the organization's been around for a while. Um, and the way we, the initial impetus was, you know, it'd be helpful to get visibility of the, the level of traffic that's occurring over uh, charted waters. Um, so things like the way we, we would use it is, um, you know, say we look at the vessel traffic uh, uh, near a chart. Uh, let's say anchoring is happening beyond uh, where we're charting, uh, you know, the chart footprint, we would say, okay, maybe we should extend uh, the chart footprint to, to include where, where those vessels are, are anchoring or otherwise loitering uh, to make sure that they you know, have information to be safe. So that's like one example of the way we, would, uh, we were thinking about using this, this type of data. So that brings up the question, does this make sense, the hours per, um, uh, hours per month per square kilometer as, as an analytic. Um, so that's one thing to think about in, in terms of science applications. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Hazel to, to give a, a summary of, of what's in the chat box. We'll start there and then we'll open up to the, uh, the collaboration teams for their, their reactions to what was just presented. Hazel? Yeah, thanks. Um, this, was, this was really interesting. It looks like a really cool product to have. Um, there's a few clarifying questions in the chat so far, um, the, the length of data available, um, whether or not it'll be available for download. Um, I think those, those questions have been answered pretty thoroughly. I guess I would open it to um, Aaron or Kathy or uh, Lindsay, if any of you wanted to follow up on your questions. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, that's is super impressive. Is it possible to zoom in on Alaska? Absolutely possible. Yeah, let me go over there. No one was going to ask like to do this in the polar in the polar projection or in the um, in, in is this okay in the web Mercator projection? Let's just check it out. Yeah. Glad we asked that because I was about to do And it looks like we have a couple of hands raised. Um, so maybe while you get this set up, it'll definitely be interesting to look at the Alaska data. Um, uh, I think Jonathan, you had raised your hand. Yeah, I, I have a quick question. It, um, it was from when you had the polar projection displayed before in, um, in the Arctic region over Europe. The, um, you know, some of those track lines 
you could you could make out okay this is a a surveying effort and that might in fact be you know one organization one maybe it's even um, some of those track lines were from the mosaic project the NSF is a co-sponsor of so are there any concerns um, I mean that's it'd be interesting to verify oh yeah that was actually this cruise but are there any concerns about um, in these areas where there's uh, not that much uh, vessel traffic, if you can make out the um, the movements of individual vessels, is that a concern or is there a filter you can use to protect uh, sensitive information? If it's like an industry survey and they're, they're trying to protect whatever um, resource they're surveying and the location of it that might be disclosed through such a tool? That's a fantastic question. Um, Ted, do you, do you have thoughts on that before we open that important question to discussion? Yeah, can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat that really quick? I was just looking at the I, chat. I think, I, think I, can, I think I can take a first stab, Ted. So the question just to, to summarize is, are, are we concerned about being able to identify individual vessels? Um, so the, the answer is sort of, but not really, at least from my perspective. So all of the data that we have here is from commercial publicly available sources. So um, if this particular service, um, somebody was able to go cross verify that with a totally public other source or maybe even private source to find the identity of a vessel, they most likely already have the ability to uniquely identify that vessel already. Um, and in our particular case, we'll never actually show um, what that vessel is in terms of, um, you know, uh, the, the, sh the ship name or MMSI. So we'll never um, individually identify it. Um, there have been some discussions about whether we want to aggregate this data um, into a slightly higher um, low count bin um, so that it's not as obvious um, to show the sort of individual vessel tracks. But I think generally, it's not a concern mostly because all of this data is like publicly available. So if I just go on marine traffic.net right now, I could probably find all of these vessels that would, you know, be in that operating in that particular area. Yeah, Thanks, well, Alex. Go ahead. I, yeah, just to just to just to emphasize, yeah, the, the goal of this is not to be able to track individual vessels. We're not we're not after that. There are implications beyond um, beyond what we're looking for for this. So yeah, you'll be able to filter by vessel type and specifications, uh, as, as Alex mentioned, um, which could lead you to, you know, to figure out certain vessels through analysis, but uh, we will not uh, be present, you know, creating a tool that, that will, that will, you'll be able to track an individual vessel or, or like a military fleet or something like that. So I do want to, this is Mike, I do want to separate intent from, you know, consequence. Uh, Jonathan's point remains, um, I think, an important risk, and this is something that has constrained uh, AIS data uh, dissemination in the past and continues to, the general attitude of, you know, um, many, many, uh, for example, commercial companies, they don't want to be tracked, they don't want to be, um, show their, their location for a variety of legitimate reasons. Um, so the, the mood has tended to be, you know, to try to avoid, um, you know, um, infringing on those those those, uh, the, those private uh, somewhat private activities. So it's still it's still a constraint, still a risk that we have to think about. And it's a really good point in the Arctic case where it, there might be cases where, while this is a very generalized data set, um, it's, one might start to be able to pick up behavior of, like as Johnson mentioned, uh, survey vessels. Um, and that just kind of uh, brings up that important dissemination risk that with AIS data that has been around for a long time. So I think we should consider that uh, as a risk, document it, and think about it and, and ensure that we, there's things in place to mitigate that risk. So thank, thank you, Jonathan, for that, for that comment. Thanks. Um, I think I'm going to hop to Lindsay. You put some questions in the chat, and we'll, we'll Danielle, you'll You'll be next, but these seem related to that last question. So, um, Lindsay, do you want to come off mute? Um, if not, I can read some of your questions out. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. 
Yeah, I just had a question about the detail provided for each ship. If we do want, is it, um, if we do want to track like a specific vessel or understand more than just the vessel type information? I know I'm, I'm typically used to using like IHS marketplace data, which um, usually gives like a vessel ID. Um, so I was just curious. Yeah, good, good point. Database. So, so on the back end, um, we actually have um, in, internally to map large, all of the um, identifying information that we use to actually build up this particular density raster. One of the data sharing agreement um, sort of um, areas that we had to um, negotiate on when we were talking to the providers about um, providing a publicly available service is that um, it has to fall within a term that they call um, a derived product, meaning that um, we cannot um, sort of disseminate any um, anything about the AIS message in a sense that is um, that that would you know preclude you guys actually going and having to buy the data from the from the provider themselves. And so in terms of um, like identifying ship information, like um, like the actual specific ship ID, we will not be able to provide that uh, in this particular construct. Um, but stuff like um, draft, like ship characteristics, um, like draft, length, width, um, potentially fuel type, if it's in the AIS message, we currently have the ability to process on it. If it's not, there are some sites out there that would enable us to do a cross lookup verification of those, um, but we have not yet investigated that and it's not currently in scope for our project. So that would be sort of an additional next step, but it is technically feasible to take the ship ID and go find additional um, information about the ship vessel itself and then potentially use that in the future to increase the um, number or uh, amount of filters that we provide to the community if it's useful. Okay, so wait, I'm a little confused because you just said you were not going to be including ship ID and then you just said you could use the ship ID to go find that, so. Um... Well, what we would do is on the on our internal network, so you'll see that, um, you know, here I'm in, in our like little internal development network that never actually goes out to the public. So you actually need a login and a password and, you know, it's, it's protected. Um, on the external site, what we actually end up publishing in that particular case would be the general like bucket. So we would maybe say something like, you know, draft size is between um, zero and five, five and 10, 10 and 20. So you can never really identify a specific vessel or anything like that, but you would, you would get general classes. It's sort of like the ship type category filter, where it's like, we're not identifying every unique fishing vessel, but you can basically see the vessels by its specific type. Does well, that make you sense? at least give like an anonymous ID so that it's possible for the user to connect positions to put together a trajectory? There, I'm, probably not. Yeah, there's, 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 this has been a, a common um, uh, concern. So I appreciate um, Lindsay bringing, bringing it up. It, there are, again, there are political implications to, um, and concerns to uh, presenting ship ID information um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a format such as this. So despite MapLarge having access to uh, to that information to create this product, the user will not be able to to, ident to identify, uh, you know, will not will not be able to to focus in on an individual ship or vessel vessel track by itself. Now, how they use the filters could yield um, some some insight into things like that, but yeah, we we are not um, we are not seeking to provide users with a tool to track individual uh, vessels. Mm. That's, that's clear to us. Okay, that's challenging. So we touched on, yeah. uh, we touched on, um, I was gonna say, go ahead. Mike, uh, just, just quickly, I was gonna say like, yeah, I, I think if, if I understand and, and maybe we can talk about your use case more specifically and various ways to kind of think about um, how to address that. But, but the, the overall objective of this capability is to, is to provide a way to visualize and analyze seasonal patterns and trends. So this is a much sort of broader brush capability to say, 
how is patterns and trends changing either seasonally or over time? Um, and, you know, obviously there's some challenges there with data normalization and data volume getting more and more, but, but generally sort of figuring out how to visualize and analyze patterns and trends over time is really the, the MO of this capability. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. So clearly, lots. These are uh, good dissemination access um, questions, and can, obviously an, an ongoing discussion. But I do want to uh, uh, try to get some feedback on potential science applications, given what you've um, what we what you've seen. What are some thoughts on ways this could be used? Obviously, there's still questions remaining on you know what the data actually are. Um, but just any any initial reactions to potential science applications um, in the Arctic specifically that you want to share. Yeah, we have a few hands up. Danielle, go ahead. Sure. So I had two questions. Um, and so I think that my second question gets um, more to your lead in about science applications, potentially. So the first question I had is whether you have communicated with the Marine Exchange of Alaska or the Arctic Domain Awareness Center uh, in Alaska, um, and whether you have any of your beta testers from the Bering Strait region. Um, I'm just curious the level of engagement in our part of the world. If you could answer that first, then I'll get into my, my follow-up question on, with more of a science application. Thanks. Yeah, I'll have to check. I think we did have some beta participants from the Arctic region of mm -hmm. the um, International Hydrographic Organization, but I don't think we had anybody from that specific group that you just mentioned. Yeah, that, that's correct, Alex. Yeah, we, we don't, I, I don't believe we have anyone from that specific group, but definitely Arctic is represented uh, a little bit via uh, some of the Nordic countries, um, regional hydrographic commissions there, but certainly um, would like to hear from, from some of the US Arctic. Yeah, I think there, there's a lot of opportunity for some um, individuals who've been working on this sort of thing quite a bit in Alaska, um, real, that's some real opportunity for engagement. Um, so I'd be happy to connect you with some of those individuals. Um, my, my other question was, um, and, and this may be a really naive question, so apologies, but I'm not sure um, within the AIS system how vessel type uh, is assigned and whether the operator of the vessel has the opportunity to change their vessel type. And, you know, one, one big issue in um, Alaska, especially in the Bering Strait region right now, is the footprint of research vessel operations and ship and fishing vessel operations. Um, and in Alaska, um, often it, it is fishing vessels that are chartered to conduct research uh, or survey activities for agencies like NOAA if they don't have a NOAA vessel available. And I could see people uh, being interested in the relative footprint of research vessels versus fishing vessels versus agency survey vessels. And I'm curious if operators have the opportunity cruise by cruise to change their vessel type to make it obvious if they're working on research, if they're working on commercial fishing, to um, do, you know, help to make sure that at least that level of information is accurate in, in a system like this. Hey, Danielle, thanks for that question. Um, and that's a really good point, actually, that, that hints to a broader, um, a broader aspect of, of AIS data. It's, it, it's user input, right? It's the mariner at, at, on the bridge that is, that is inputting this information. Um, some of it is derived from, from GPS and things like that, but, but by and large, a lot of things are just literally punched in. Um, and as a former mariner myself, I can tell you that, uh, like a lot of things that are done by user input that creates some concerns about the accuracies of the data. So this is definitely something we, we should, we should, we should ponder. Um, I'm not sure I have a specific, um, answer to that concern. But it's it 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 points at a larger concern that we have about about how to work through some of those um, the data inaccuracies. Alex, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I, I think that covers it. Yeah, we we want to figure out ways to make that process less concerning to the end user, um, but we are relying in some sense on the AIS message itself, which we know sometimes is inherently flawed, as you guys saw with the navigation status, uh, you know, flag. Um, 
One thing that we are doing uh, for research vessels and icebreakers in particular is that we, we have had a, um, we do have a list of specific vessels that we're pulling out for that category. I don't believe we're sharing that list, but I, I will check with Ted and Kayla and maybe we can uh, for some of the internal folks like you all uh, potentially that, that have a little bit more of a stake in that. Um, but we, one of the new sort of uh, ship types is going to be sort of a, a curated list of known research and ice breaking vessels by uh, name or MMS, MMSI uh, value. Um, and, and so that list is kind of one way that we're trying to reduce or, or in, increase confidence in something that's as sensitive as things like those research and, uh, and ice breaking tasks. Danielle, was your was your question answered? I, I I feel like there was in there. There's also kind of a standards related question about the way AIS data are designed. So there's the user input um, uh, challenge. This is all kind of crowdsourced data, crowdsourced data, but then also the the types of information or you know, the fields are, are pre-specified. So to make sure we weren't missing an aspect of your your question related to standards that um, uh, inform AIS data. Yeah, I guess I was. Um, I guess the the question was whether you know whether a vessel you know a given vessel is always categorized as a fishing vessel or a research vessel or uh, you know or cruise by cruise if that can be reassigned you know if if the operator is willing to take the time to do it um, to make it more accurate it, it can be reassigned and we do see some cases where they are um, but it's not it's not as frequent as you might expect thank you Okay, it looks like uh, we'll go to Aaron and then John. Yeah, thank, and thanks again for the presentation today. This is really great stuff. Um, so I guess to answer a couple of your questions about management applications, um, absolutely yes. In fact, um, we have a study right now with a couple of federal and state agencies here in Alaska where we actually bought a bunch of AIS data from Exact Earth, who I'm guessing you guys have heard of. Um, and we basically paid an analyst to produce the type of results that you have here that appear to be downloadable. <laughs> um, so it's, it's kind of wonderful what you've produced in terms of like applications. In this case, we're looking at, you know, sensitive species, marine mammals, uh, marine birds, an overlap with, you know, sort of haul outs and, um, you know, kind of marine areas that they focus um, on. And, and your kind of vessel footprint is how we describe it like the hours per square kilometer is very similar to what we're doing um, uh, with, with those studies. Another application, um, and I'll throw, actually I'll just throw this in the chat. We just released a paper um, at the beginning of this year is looking at AIS data within marine protected areas. And so another application of this that is immediately apparent to me is that you could look at places around the world. In fact, this is what we did with these areas to be avoided in the Aleutian Islands where we created summaries similar to this um, to see the change of when those went into effect and if they're working. Uh, so that might be another potential use of it. It's great stuff. Um, I, I guess I, I had, did have a question though in terms of the, the source of the data, and I'm sorry if, if I missed it, but do you guys purchase it from like a retail company? Yeah, unfortunately, we're not able to share the actual sources that we are getting the data from, but they okay. are uh, commercially available sources and uh, other open source available sources as well. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks again. Thanks so much for that for, for that input. And it sounded like uh, John had a question. Yeah, good after, afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is John Lowell. I, I work over at NGA with the with the team doing all this. I'm uh, kind of the cheerleader in the background. I, I guess that's my seems to be my my role on many many different projects. But uh, I think the, the the key takeaway to this effort is really we are trying to answer many questions, but we're not answering all the questions. And we put some constraints or guardrails around the project that Alex and Ted have talked about. Some of this was to deal with some, some issues that we really didn't want to bubble up. But the, the actual challenge here is how can we produce this regular, reoccurring, updated product usable to as many people as possible 
on the assumption that if anybody has a specialty question to answer, they will have to do what uh, I believe it was Mr. Poe mentioned, which is purchase, analyze, output a specific product to a, to what to, that would answer the question you're trying to answer. That will still exist. That's not going away. This is really to allow a much broader question so that any user with a couple of mouse clicks can probably answer close to 80% of the questions they might have. You're not going to get 100%. And, I, and of course, what complicates this is it's global. And I would like to make a quick comment on the AIS data field, as everyone has mentioned. Clearly, anything that is user input is subject to error. Uh, I think Alex is a, a graphic of, uh, I don't think it was a ground, but it was a it was moored and they were all over the ocean. So the key, the, the key there is, is Alex's team is doing everything they can behind the scenes to, 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 to capture where things are in error and come up with alternative um, outputs or, 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 or ways to look at the data that could be closer to the truth than what we're actually getting from the raw AIS message. And can the status of a vessel be changed? Yes, it's just a couple of clicks of the AIS button on the bridge of the ship. Can the type of the vessel be, be changed? Yes, it's a couple of clicks of the AIS on the thing. I would put out there for those of you who are defining science projects in your project instructions to the vessel itself, is be rather specific on that. Is just say, you know, when you are operating on project, we would like you to be in vessel status A or B or C or whatever it is. Understanding that there's only a, num a, a specific number of categories that, are, that you're capable of clicking out. But uh, it's great discussion by, uh, by all here. And thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks so much, John. I wasn't sure if you were on, but thanks so much for those comments. And uh, thank you for joining us. We have five minutes left. Um, any other comments? I don't know if we heard from the Coastal Resilience team, if there were any reactions before we close. No, this is John. Just thanks so much uh, for the presentation. Um, and I'll be passing it on to others to, to learn more about this um, effort. So thanks a lot. Thanks so much, John. Uh, Jonathan Blythe, uh, do you want to say anything before we wrap up? Oh, um, yeah, I guess next month, uh, the end of the month of July, we'll have a, a joint meeting with the terrestrial ecosystem and modeling team to look at integrated ecosystem assessments and um, also some data management practices around model data and uh, observational data. So uh, stay tuned for the invite for that. Thanks so much, Jonathan. And Hazel, just a reminder, if we can grab the discussion uh, in, in the chats and share that with the group, that'd be helpful. And uh, do you want to turn over, Ted, any, any final words to wrap us up? Uh, just uh, again, thank you, everyone. Uh, appreciate you letting us um, have this time. Uh, Mike, thank you uh, for setting this up and, uh, and for really being uh, the, one of the fathers of this, uh, of this project. Um, and uh, yeah, really good feedback here. Uh, we're, you know, apologies that we, that, as John said, that this, this tool may not answer every question from everyone. Um, we're painting a pretty large brush here and we're aware of that, but this feedback is, um, is crucial to us making, making that broad brush stroke as, 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 as best it can be. So on behalf of NGA's Maritime Safety Office, I thank you everyone. And thank you, Alex, for a great presentation. Yes, thanks, Ted. Alex, terrific presentation. Thank you everyone for a great discussion. Uh, as always, Hazel, thanks so much for your um, coordinating uh, logistics and everything in the background. Uh, really appreciate it. So I think with that, I think we're, unless there's anything else, Hazel, that I'm missing, or Jonathan, I think we're ready to close. Uh, I think I think we're there. I will make sure, I know there were um, a couple of other resources that got dropped in the chat. I will make sure that those end up in the notes. And Alex and Ted, if we could enlist you once this is public to be sure to post on the IRPIC website so people can sort of follow along the progress. Um, I think you have a really interested audience here and um, we'll, we'll be excited to hear updates. So Absolutely. thank you so much. And if there's a website or anywhere where uh, folks should go to find out more information, uh, let me know and I'll include that in the notes as well. Thanks and we've, Alex posted uh, the 
the team's email there. I posted my personal working or my work email as well. So if anyone needs to reach out directly to me or to the team, um, please do. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.